And the problem is that each of these little protons has got positive charge. And one of the things that we always learn is that like charges repel. You try bringing positive charges together, and they don't want to come together and fuse and build up the heavier elements. They just want to stay apart from each other. How on earth are we going to do that? Well, let's first of all see if we can do it here. We have got two protons on the front of the bench. Can somebody come along and help me bring them together? <coughs> Who would like to have, would like to have a go? Right. What's your name? Dorothy. Right, Dorothy. Now, if you hold that at arm's length, just at, at the tip there, and this other one also at arm's length at the tip here, and just try gently to bring them together. It's not easy, is it? Right. Now, you probably think that she's cheating. Um, let's <laughs> right, thank you. Anybody else give a try? Nobody wants to. Do you want to have a try? Right. You hold, again, that very gently at one end. Show proton to everybody. Right. An upside-down proton. Let's try an upside-up proton. And uh, whatever this one is saying, like that. Ready, Co? Right, point them towards the camera. Very gently see if you can get them together. No, they just don't want to go. It's very difficult. Thanks very much. <laughs> so that shows you how difficult it is to get two similar things together. What you're trying to do in the sun is to get the two protons together at a distance less than a millionth of a millionth of a centimeter. That's going to be incredibly difficult. How on earth is it possible to do it? Well, the extra ingredient that the sun has got is heat. But the center of the sun is incredibly hot. In this particular case, it means that the things are moving around very violently. And as a result of that, they can crash into each other. If I threw those two protons together violently, they would crash, even though they want to stay apart. And once they've crashed together, they can fuse and build up the nuclei of helium and generate energy. So that's how the sun burns. And in fact, not just the sun, but any star. From this insight, one can now understand how stars work. Stars start off as hydrogen gas in space. And gradually, gravity does pull it together. It starts under its own weight, falling inwards. And as the hydrogen falls in, it starts bumping and friction warms it up. A star is born. It starts eventually glowing infrared. You can't yet see it. It then enters the visible spectrum, just like the cannonball in reverse. And then glows white and all the way around its cycle until eventually all the fuel is spent. All the hydrogen has been used up. This is the life cycle of our sun. Eventually, all the hydrogen will have gone and the sun will end its life. And in our particular case, it will grow into what's called a red giant. Now, don't worry about this too much. I mean, when the sun's burnt out, that's it. No tomorrow. But thankfully, it's at least five billion years away. The sun was born about five billion years ago, and it's now in middle age, about halfway through its life cycle, with five billion still left, so you can sleep easily tonight. I gave a lecture like this a few years ago, and at the end of it, somebody said to me, uh, did you say five billion years left or five million years? And I said, five billion. And they said, oh, that's all right then. <laughs> of course, different stars have different endings, but they all have the same sort of beginnings. The way that they end up just depends upon how much hydrogen there was to begin with. If you've got more hydrogen than the sun, or less hydrogen than our sun has, your end of the life might be as a black hole, or it might be that you manage to take on a new life, where the helium waste products themselves start fusing and building up the nuclei of even heavier elements, like carbon and oxygen, the stuff that we're all made of. And such stars do exist, and they sometimes explode. We call them supernova, and they throw all of that carbon, oxygen, iron, and all the heavy elements out and pollute the universe with them. And such a star exploded just as our own galaxy was beginning, the solar system here. And that's how the carbon and oxygen in this room originally got here, by stars exploding. 
So we now know how the stars work. It's all fusion going on inside. Looking out at the stars, you see what nature can do out there. It gives you ideas to what you might be able to do down here, things that you might never have thought of before. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could reproduce that fusion power of the sun here on Earth? Because the fuel for fusion is hydrogen, and hydrogen comes from water, and water is everywhere. So we'd have a wonderful fuel source. <coughs> if only we could reproduce that incredible temperature, like the center of the sun, tens of millions of degrees, we could then bring those protons together and build up waste products and produce energy. So the first thing you have to do is to produce the 10 million degrees. And we have got some colleagues in Manchester who have brought us this powerful machine here. It says off. It is off, is it? it is. Thank you. You will see why I took care of that in a minute. So we are going to build up electric charge on here and then release it in a pulse. It will send a brief current around <coughs> the metal wire. And these magnets will then transfer that inside the tube to a gas which is sitting inside this tube here. This donut is called a torus. And in that moment, it will heat the gas to a temperature of 10 million degrees. One of the things you have to do to create fusion power. So I will now retire from this and hide behind the, the bench while Bryson powers up our small prototype of a fusion reactor. Just keep watching the donut and wait for the flash if it works. There you see it. That gas, when it exploded in that thing for that moment, was at a temperature of about 10 million degrees. The same sort of temperature that you see in the, star, in the center of the sun. Now, that is one third of what we have to do. In order to make fusion work and be practical as a power source, you need to do three things. You need to get the temperature high enough, and you're seeing that before you. You need to have the gas dense enough. Well, this gas is, is very rarefied. And you also have to get the spark going long enough. But as you see here, the spark only flashes for a brief moment. But this is one third of what they're trying to do in the fusion program to produce fusion energy. And I think for safety, we better let Bryson turn that off before, in my excitement, I touch it and turn into a real bright spark. Thank you, Bryson. <laughs> my nerves feel better immediately. So we have shown you here a temperature of 10 million degrees, the temperature that exists in the center of the sun, the temperature that the whole universe was at only three minutes after the start of time. And now at last, we can begin to put the pieces together. We have seen the center of the sun. We know how it works. Nature has given us this possibility and given us ideas of what we might do here to replicate it. But we begin to understand how the early moments of the universe must have been. 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe finally was cold enough that atoms could stay together. But the simplest atoms, hydrogen, with the proton in the middle and the electrons on the outside, could remain together and progress through the universe. Before that time, the universe was much hotter, so hot that the atom couldn't survive like this, the individual pieces, which we now know are electrons and protons, would be whirling around completely independently of each other, making what we call a plasma. What you saw just now was a plasma. The sun is a plasma. The electrically charged particles, electrons and protons, moving around independently of each other. That's what the universe was like before 300,000 years. Right back to the first three minutes. It was at that time when the protons themselves were being formed. And we're going to go back even earlier than that. We're going to go back to the first second and see what the universe was like when the bits and pieces that made up the protons themselves were being formed. And that's for next time. Thank you. <laughs> And that lecture is tomorrow afternoon at 10 to 3.
Thank you.